back around about kerosene. Um, it uh, was the original reason why drilling for oil started in the 19th century, because all everywhere in Europe and the US, people um, lit their houses with kerosene lamps. But of course, that's no longer the case, but it is the case in the developing world, where, where 1.6 billion estimated people um, still use kerosene as their major source of lighting. So there have been, you would think that given that 20% of the world uses kerosene for lighting, that it would have been widely studied. But in fact, there's been very, very few studies. But those that have uh, occurred, and we've done a bunch of them, suggest that kerosene may be, more, at least the PM 2.5 generated, uh, produced by kerosene, may be more potent on a per mass basis uh, in terms of causing respiratory effects than PM 2.5 from um, biomass burning for cooking. So I don't have time to go into that. Uh, it's a topic of another lecture in itself. Um, anyway, just I'll just say that and um, uh, move on, because I'm going to be talking mainly about exposure in this talk. So until recently, kerosene you know, was advocated as a, uh, an improvement on biomass, particularly for cooking. Uh, but the international agencies are beginning to change their mind about that. So, but moving to lighting, uh, this is the typical kerosene lamp that you find in the developing world. Um, I have a couple here, a few props. And they're made out of food containers and lacquer containers and um, uh, just modified slightly and um, they generate about one lux of light, and you find them everywhere. And the nice thing about them uh, is, at least from the, the user's perspective, is you can buy whatever amount of kerosene you can afford and put it in that, even if you only have a very little amount of money. So, um, and they go by different names. They're called Koroboys in Kenya, uh, Tukis in Nepal, which is the other country where I do a lot of work. So. We know certain things about kerosene, it's pretty well established that uh, poisoning is the, the major cause of child poisoning in developing countries. And typically what happens is that people buy a small amount of kerosene, they put it in a drink bottle, the child comes along and drinks it. So that's very common. And also there's the cause of fires. Uh, it's easy to kick these things over. And also uh, some people use kerosene stoves, easy to kick them over. And they cause a lot of fires. And if accidentally you mix a tiny bit of uh, gasoline in there, even if you were to fill it up with gasoline accidentally, tip it out, and then fill it with diesel, and then try and light it, it would probably explode. Just because just a little bit of gasoline uh, mixed in with the, the kerosene will cause uh, an explosion quite easily. So we know that kerosene you know, is quite hazardous, but what we don't really know is what about the emissions from the kerosene lamps? There's very little information on those, very, very little. So moving to African countries. So uh, kerosene is used for lighting very commonly in African countries um, because they just, you just can't get the electricity, uh, particularly in the rural areas. And um, uh, some countries use candles predominantly and some use kerosene, but in Kenya, which I'm going to be talking about, uh, they use kerosene, this Koroboys. Um, now, a number, the, there are quite a few NGOs working to provide solar lamps to replace these kerosene lamps. And the major motivation is largely economic. Uh, they, the idea is that uh, by replacing the kerosene, they will provide better lighting, um, and hopefully they'll raise the standard of living of the, the countries of, the, of the, the families that, that um, have the, the solar lamps. So there have been a few studies looking at the economics of uh, replacing kerosene lamps with solar lamps. And in fact, that's how we got involved. Um, a study funded by Google was happening uh, in Kenya to, or at least was planned in Kenya, to investigate whether or not the standard of living of families would be raised by uh, supplying uh, solar lamps uh, to families using kerosene lamps. And they had the idea that maybe we should, they should look at health at the same time. 
And that's how they got in touch with, with myself and Nick Lamb, a former doctoral student here, as some of you all know. And they said, can you add on a kind of a health component to our study where we're looking to see whether it's, uh, um, you know, improved well-being of families? And we said, sure. And then, uh, so we started to think about this and plan it. And uh, we thought, well, first of all, we need to know what the exposure is associated with kerosene lamps uh, so that we can calculate the sample size for our uh, health study. Uh, and then when we looked, there was no information on uh, anywhere. Nobody had examined uh, uh, how or investigated how much uh, exposure people received from these kerosene lamps. So we decided that before we could do a health-related study, say like a clinical trial, we needed to do an exposure study figure out what is the, what is the, the, uh, the reduction in exposure from moving from kerosene to solar, and from that we could work out the sample size that we needed for our study. So that led to the study that, that we did. Um, uh, so basically the idea was we decided we, we, we recruited 20 families and we wanted to be able to look at school kids doing their homework, as well as adults. So we worked through a school, a high school, and we recruited 20 families, uh, all of which had a, a senior student uh, who would be doing homework. Um, and we measured baseline uh, PM2.5 and carbon monoxide. And then uh, we went back about three or four weeks later and after they'd been given three kerosene lamps, they, we measured the, the baseline measures, PM2.5 and carbon monoxide. We gave them three, keros three solar lamps of this type, my other prop. We gave each family three of these, and they have three levels of light. light. And there's a solar panel with them too, but I didn't bring that, but you'll see a picture. And then we went back, uh, and we gave three because um, we figured that if we didn't give three, uh, the kids doing homework would not get one. You know, the parents would take if we gave one. Most studies, I think, which is a mistake, that have, have looked into the replacing kerosene with solar have given one lamp. And I think that was a big limitation of those studies. Uh, so we gave three because we could see that there were multiple lamp users in a family. Okay, so um, you see it here. It's on the border with Uganda. It's a small, and quite near Lake Victoria. So, um, and so we, we, um, we approached the school. We looked at a number of schools in the area. We approached the school, uh, St. Peter's Budokomi Secondary School. And we talked, the, the principal and the head science teacher were very enthusiastic. And uh, we, we gave a few pet talks to the students and so on, and their, and their parents who are not showing in this, in this slide. Um, and they were very enthusiastic to participate. So we had several uh, selection criteria. We needed to have an adult head of household. <clears throat> no electricity supply primary lighting source kerosene, and we needed at least one non-smoking kerosene lamp user in the household because we wanted to use that person as one of our study subjects, as well as having the, the school pupil. Um, and finally, a separate kitchen building from the main house. Uh, so this is uh, typically in Kenya and other African countries. Um, they, have a set, they have a compound in a bunch of different buildings, and uh, um, one of them is a kitchen building. And you can see they have a, just a typical three stone fire, three stones, big stones with a fire in the middle and a pot on top, fills up with smoke. And so uh, that's a big advantage over Nepal, where, where I also do a lot of work, where the, the kitchen, also using biomass uh, uh, cooking, the kitchen is usually inside the house. So the whole house fills up with smoke, so nobody really avoids it. But here, um, uh, 
Only, usually only the, the, the cook, which is usually the, the mother in the house, actually gets heavily exposed. So these are the things we measured. These are the, the study components. And I'm really only going to be talking about um, uh, the use monitoring. We monitored use of both the kerosene lamps and the solar lamps. And I'm going to talk about the personal monitoring. Um, uh, so uh, to measure, to monitor the use, we fitted the kerosene lamps in the house, the Corroboys, and this is a, this is a uh, um, um, hurricane lamp, but really we had none in the study. Everybody used the Corroboys. <coughs> and so we basically, on the neck of the Corroboy, we fitted the SUMS, the stove use monitoring system. Some of you may be familiar with these, that they, they measure the changes in temperature. So you can see uh, when, you know, we, we, we tested these out before, and it works, it, measure, it, it detects the changes in temperature while when the, the kerosene lamp is used. Okay, and so this is a, an example of the sorts of the pattern of data that we get. And this, these are four uh, kerosene lamps from a single household. And you can see that three of them, and see, so the, this is, so you can see this is the use of the, the kerosene lamp, lighting the kerosene lamp. Um, and this is after we gave the solar lamps, and this is just the diurnal temperature pattern, okay? And um, interestingly, the fourth kerosene lamp continued to be used, which actually uh, um, is part of the evidence that we have that the, the, the solar lamps replaced the kerosene lamps on like a one-to-one -one basis. So if you have four, if you have three, uh, um, uh, kerosene lamps, you need three solar lamps to replace them. Okay. So, um, and so this one didn't get replaced. We, we, don't, we only gave three, so they continue to use one uh, kerosene lamp. Okay. Now, so, so we also, um, we also measured, we also uh, monitored the, the use of the um, uh, solar lamps. So we fitted the solar lamps with this internal device here, which uh, actually measures the time that they're turned on and off. And so you can tell the length of time that the, the solar lamp is being used. So we got data both on solar lamp use and, and we, we left these monitors in place across the study. Okay. So this is the typical pattern. This is across all the households. So you can see they use them in the morning and they use them in the evening. And we saw the same pattern with kerosene lamps as well. And also, it was nice to see the uh, the, the uh, and this is across the the days from the you know when the households received the, the lamps, they continue to use them at the rate of about five hours per lamp per day per solar lamp per day. And when we compared the use, so this is the baseline. As I, we divided this into two kerosene lamps in three to five kerosene lamps households, okay? So this is the baseline, kerosene use. And this over here is follow-up three or four weeks later. And you can see kerosene lamp use has dropped off a great deal. This is solar lamp use and this is combined lamp use. And we also did one week prior to follow-up. The, the reason we did one week prior to follow-up is because we were concerned that the households would change their behavior when we came back. Uh, in the follow-up week, but we were actually monitoring across all the weeks. So we looked at one week prior to follow-up, and you can see that it's pretty much the same. There's really no change. So they didn't change their behavior when we came back to in the follow-up monitoring, which was good. And you can some a similar pattern with the three to five kerosene lamps, um, except that they got more light. If they only had two kerosene lamps, they used more light. but. When they had three to five, they used much the same light, amount of light. So that was good. It shows the, you know, the acceptability of these things. And they weren't just doing things just to please us. OK, so we did personal monitoring as well. So we had a local tailor make a bunch of vests. And we, we put in a, uh, a, a PM 2.5 monitor, a micro PM, and had it here. And then we had a, a tube that went up to here into the breathing zone, it was sort of fitted into the vest, and we put a Alaska CO monitor 
uh, in the in the vest pocket here, and we we in, we outfitted both the the parents and also the the, the school pupils with these uh, vests, and they were quite willing to wear them for 48 hours. Although we said, told the kids that they didn't have to wear them when they were at school, that please put them on when they came home. Okay, so this is a typical this is typical data. This is, uh, while they were still using kerosene lamps, you can see uh, personal monitoring, you can see the PM2.5 going up, and this is after they received the solar lamp. So a big drop in PM2.5 exposure, just an example. And so without spending any time on this, just you can see the, these are the adults. The blue is, is uh, while they still had the kerosene lamps, we didn't take the kerosene lamps away. Um, but while they were only using kerosene lamps, the the orange or red is after the provision of solar lamps. And so you can see there is actually a sort of drop off. And that is in the parents. But with the kids, it's a little more dramatic. The children don't go into the cooking hut. These are, seen, these are older kids. They don't, they don't usually go into the cooking hut. Unlike the, the, the mothers here who spend, you know, they go in and out. They do the cooking. The kids, they mostly get exposed while they're, they're doing their homework. Okay, so uh, this just summarizes the results. So basically we found uh, for the adults something like a 50% a, a reduction in PM2.5 exposure across 24 hours. And um, for the, the kids, nearly a three quarters percent, three quarters reduction in exposure. So most of their exposure was coming from, you know, using the PM2.5 exposure was coming from using the kerosene lamps uh, during uh, homework. Now, that's exposure. So, and I have to thank, thank Nick Lamb for this. We, other previous speakers have already talked about the integrated exposure response curves. And so these are a number of them for different health outcomes. Uh, pneumonia and lung cancer, ischemic heart disease. And so this, the blue here, represents the adults. So this is the reduction for the adults. And the, the red or the orange represents the school kids. And uh, you can see that, it, that the, the reduction occurs in the area where you might expect quite a, a, a good health benefit. If it had been up over here, exposure being over here, we would have seen relatively little change across the, the reduction in exposure. But here, um, we see quite a, a potentially quite a big drop in in um, in risk, relative risk. This is relative risk. This is exposure. So I hope that makes sense. Mm -hmm. As a way of just illustrating what we might expect. But in fact, there's very little, there's virtually nothing, not, not nothing, but almost nothing in terms of uh, health studies um, to, to uh, investigate potential um, health risks of kerosene lamps. So these are the conclusions. Um, approximately a hundred, both adults and, and uh, school pupils, about 100 micrograms per cubic meter reduction in exposure to PM2.5 across 24 hours on average. Um, very large displacement of kerosene lamp use, which, which those of you who have done any work on the household uh, uh, air pollution from cooking stoves will know this is a huge reduction. With, with cook stoves, you, you might be lucky to get 40 to 60 percent reduction. Um, it's, it's been really disappointing and unsuccessful, but this is <laughs> potentially very, very, uh, uh, very good. Um, uh, yeah, and we think that we could, we could potentially find health benefits if we were to do a randomised trial. So we hope to get the funding for that, but uh, Google unfortunately has changed their funding priorities since we started this, so they're not so keen to, to fund that part of it. I just want to acknowledge my co-investigators, particularly Nick Lamb and other colleagues from Uganda who did most of the field work, uh, Kat Harrison of Solar Aid, and several colleagues from Kemri, Kenya Medical Research Institute, 
And um, uh, Ilsa Rose Mikado, who some of you will know, she did uh, uh, the sums analysis. And just to acknowledge uh, those who helped us with the study, in Google Ireland who funded the, the study. Otherwise known as the tax shelter. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so thank you very much. Very nice, Michael. Um, any questions? I have a question regarding the cost of kerosene. I mean, from a, a just a, a, is kerosene expensive in Kenya? No, it's not. It's funded by the government. I think I've mentioned it in an earlier slide. Oh, yeah, it's funded by the government. And, and so it makes a big difference because in Nepal, where we did our original work on kerosene and where we started to see that there were potentially problems with it, um, people were using it a lot. And then the government removed the subsidy and they don't use it at all now. Mm. So it does make a difference. Steve, did you have a question? Uh, yeah, I have a question and a comment. Uh, in this country, when, at one time, our major source of domestic indoor lighting at night was a whale oil lamp. And a whale oil lamp is essentially one of those right there. It didn't have a glass shade. When kerosene became available, it's much dirtier fuel, and almost everyone converted their whale oil lamps with a glass shade, or else they came up with a new lamp that had a glass shade on it because it was much dirtier fuel. What is the effect of a glass shade on the emissions, the, the PM, uh, from, the, from the burning kerosene? And two, was there any control of people possibly having a glass shade on their lamps at their houses because that would seem to that would seem to maybe have an effect. So well, I mean the the, the, the hurricane lamps have glass shades, but they don't use them very much because they burn more kerosene, and you know, so so they, they 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 burn brighter, and they probably funnel the the fumes upward. They may reduce exposure. I don't I don't really know. So, I have a comment. Uh, I don't think you mentioned this, except that you slipped once and said diesel instead of kerosene. Did I say? Yeah, but that's good, because for those of you uh, who may not know, kerosene is very close to diesel in terms of where it is in the petroleum distillate mm. spectrum. And so, it's not surprising that it's actually a dirty you know, fuel, uh, even though it was thought to be cleaner than um, biomass, um, probably is more toxic. And uh, I don't know if you want to... Um, yeah, so, 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 I mean, one of the things about India subsidizes uh, um, uh, kerosene you know, to provide light to poor families, but it got diverted to the black market because it became cheaper than diesel, so they mixed it with diesel. And, um, and now, so they've, they've, changed, they've reduced the subsidy so that diesel and kerosene are, I think, now at equal price, so there's no black market incentive to... Uh, divert the kerosene. So, I have questions. One is how much are the solar lamps and what would be the cost differential if instead of supporting the kerosene, they pay for the solar lamps? You mean they, they buy the solar lamps and... No, the, the government instead of... Oh, the government. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It, it may be so. It may be so. Uh, um, but, um, uh, you know, I don't think that it's been suggested or anything like that. Uh, uh, so the government doesn't really pay. The Kenyan government hasn't paid any attention what to that. What is the approximate cost of the solar lamps? Well, they were subsidized, and um, the, they were being. We purchased them for the study for about nine dollars each. So, um, yeah. So I mean, it, it's 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 quite feasible, I think. I do work in Malawi, and I would just say that in the few years I've been working in Malawi, there are more and more rural homes using um, these cheap LED lights they get from China. So they actually, I'm only saying that, that it seems to be affordable for poor rural families, relatively speaking. So I don't So Jackie and Drew both, yeah. and Dana. <laughs> <laughs> oh, pardon? So maybe back off of that, that question, how sustainable are the lamps? Then you're taking electronic waste, right? Instead of uh, what looks like a reusable aluminum canister. Yes. Uh, um, in the in the course of the the study, which was you know like over two months, we didn't have any lamp failures. I think they're quite good, but we haven't measured that. 
but, but you know, they, unlike some cook stoves that I know, which fail at a high rate, uh, but then they have high temperatures, so... He's rubbing it in. <laughs> 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 but the health effects from the solar is minimal, from comparison to the lamp. Yeah. 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 yeah, I mean, I don't think there are any health effects on the solar. <laughs> Drew? Yeah. Uh, my question is about the exposure profile. So we talked, I mean, you, you mentioned the hours of displacement, I mean, mm -hmm. hours of the day of displacement. I'm curious what an exposure profile might look like for a cook in one of these countries versus you know, one of these kids with kerosene. Um, so, like, a cook is exposed a few hours in the morning, a few hours in the evening. What's a kid exposed exposure look like? You mean a cook's exposure to PM2.5 generally? I didn't phrase that question very well. I guess I'm curious what, a, what kerosene lantern lighting exposure profiles look like compared to comp cooking exposure profiles. So, so the two different sources. Yeah, actually, I don't. I don't have that information. I, I, uh, I, I'm not exactly sure. I didn't do that analysis myself. What's your hunch? <laughs> <laughs> I, I think that I think we found roughly the same amount of reduction in both the kids and the and the uh, the adults. So somehow the adults were getting exposed to the kerosene lamp exposure to you know roughly as much as the kids even though doing homework. They carried them round, you know, to to. And they go to the cooking hut and so on. Where are you going? To answer that question. Okay, Kathy, and then Dana and Mike and then my stomach. Um, yeah, in some of the, uh, the experiments in Nepal that Nick and, and Ajay and others did, we actually saw surprisingly high levels from the lighting, and there, and in fact, uh, they were almost comparable, you know, to the stove. The stove is higher, but it's a shorter time period. Dana, do you have a question? Um, no, I just had a, a comment. There's a firm called Empower who makes this very portable solar lamp that you can actually blow up like in the mm -hmm. so Everyone you buy, they put them, they give it another one to a country that you need, and they work fabulously. So. Mike? Thanks, Mike. I really miss talk and uh, you know, impressive reductions. But I want to ask you something about the exposure response curves that you show. Mm -hmm. uh, so this is <laughs> sort of a bugbear of mine. He's one of the original, one of the authors of the original uh, paper yeah. on this. <laughs> Where it's being applied now somewhat uh, concerns me because let's say we have an exposure like kerosene, and I think if I understand correctly, there hasn't been a primary health study that would demonstrate effects. No, no, no. So, and there is some evidence that the PM2.5 from kerosene may be on a on a you know per weight basis more toxic than PM two point five from so it's like these so there's all sorts of caveats associated with this which yeah. we didn't really have time to go. Over, if we look at you know the, the biomass indoor crystal, that is purported to account for you know, four million deaths a year. Mm -hmm. But any of the studies that have been conducted are either negative or very mixed. The nearest analogy we have is for uh, wood burning outdoors, so forest fires, wildfires have never been significantly associated with cardiovascular disease. So my question is about the appropriateness of taking these curves and applying them to other sources of PM, which may have completely different constituents where you have absolutely no primary evidence of effect. So I totally agree, but I'm not sure what else we could do just to you try and put the, these, these concentrations into perspective. So many caveats, and you're quite right, um, but... Yeah, and I would... This is all we have. It's too bad Kirk isn't here. Uh, I wish he too. But, you know, I quite agree with you when you're talking about biomass smoke. Um, uh, but I think it's likely that kerosene exposures are... are will fit on that curve. Yeah, I, I agree. It's one of the...